In 1988, the mutilated body of a middle-aged man was found on the banks of an artificial lake in Brazil. Listed as one of the most disturbing deaths of a human being ever recorded, the question is who, or what, left the body on the reservoir. It was the afternoon of the 29th of September, 1988. The sun was shining high in the skies over Sao Paulo, bathing the huge sprawling city in a warmth that seemed to endorse the promise of the hot Brazilian summer to come. To the south, the vast surface of the Billings Reservoir shimmered with an inviting serenity, offering a respite from the humid air an escape from the worries and tedium of life, but belying a risk all too many people are willing to take. For the Billings Reservoir is not as peaceful as it may at first seem. Many deaths have occurred in and around those waters. Not a year goes by without at least one drowning, and it has also been used as a dumping ground for the bodies of many a gangland killing on the streets of Sao Paulo. But every once in a while, another kind of cadaver shows up, one which is not so easy to explain, one which scares the locals more than any other. And so it was on that beautiful spring day back in 1988, that a young boy was walking alone along the banks of the reservoir, holding a sling at his side. He had set out after school that afternoon with the intention of hunting birds and other small creatures inhabiting the long grass and woodlands surrounding the vast waterways. And he must have thought himself in luck when he spotted a large group of vultures on the opposite bank, not too far from where he was. They were all gathered around what looked like a large animal carcass, but there were too many of them to see what kind of animal it was. Only when he dispersed the birds by catapulting a stone into their midst, was the full horror of what lay beneath them revealed. It was the badly mutilated corpse of a human being. He quickly made his way to the nearest village, and breathlessly told the residents there what he had seen. The police were called, and a fire truck and two officers from the Santo Amaro Police Department arrived on the scene shortly afterwards. After a quick assessment, they all agreed that the situation was beyond any of them, and by late afternoon, the area had been cordoned off and was crawling with police officers and medical personnel. As many rumours circulated over the next few hours, and as much as people in the surrounding villages talked about the discovery amongst themselves, nothing was reported on the news or in the tabloids that evening. The body and the investigators attending the scene quietly slipped away some time during the night, and the next morning, all that remained at the location were discarded strands of police tape scattered here and there, and signs that the long grass on the banks of the reservoir had been trampled by many pairs of shoes. Nothing was heard of the case again, and slowly, but surely, the incident began to slip from the minds of the locals and pass inexorably into legend. And that's how it would have remained, possibly forevermore, if not for a twist of fate six years later, in 1994. The coroner's report and accompanying photographs were somehow leaked to the press, and low-key reports appeared in various newspapers and publications over the next few weeks. Someone, possibly working in government, had thought this case so disturbing 
that they had broken their silence and pushed the information out into the public domain. The details regarding the state in which the body was found are not for the faint of heart, and as we will discover, it comes as no surprise that those details had authorities questioning exactly what could have done this to another human being, and whether it was even possible for another person to have inflicted such injuries at all. The identity of this unfortunate individual was determined by dental records, but was not widely divulged out of respect for the victim's family. All that was known at the time was that he had been subjected to a horrible mutilation, the likes of which had never been seen before, and has never been seen since, at least not in the public sphere. According to the autopsy report, the eyes had been extracted and eyelids cut away, the tongue had been removed, the left ear had been sliced off, the lips and flesh around the mandibles and neck had been excised, and a significant piece of the jawbone was missing. Examining the rest of the body, investigators found that the armpits had each been punctured by a single hole, around 1.5 inches in diameter. Similar holes were found elsewhere on the legs and arms, where it was discovered that flesh including entire muscles had been extracted. These apertures were all uniform in terms of size and the way in which they had been inflicted. In instances where there were two holes on opposite sides of the body, such as those located in the armpits and limbs, they were found to be symmetrically aligned with each other. When the coroner attempted to inspect the state of the victim's internal organs, he was shocked to find that these had been removed too. The liver, kidneys, stomach, large and small intestines and pancreas were all missing and the chest and stomach had shrunk and sunken inwards as a result. However, there was no incision in the abdomen besides another small hole where the navel should have been, similar in size to the others. This left the coroner no choice but to conclude that the organs, along with the muscle tissues, had been sucked out via these orifices, an unusual and completely unnatural method of extraction. The victim's colon had also been cored out, leaving a huge hole where the rectum should have been. He had also been castrated, and on top of all this, every single drop of blood had been drained from his body. When trying to determine which instruments had been used to inflict such injuries, Investigators found that the holes made in the limbs and torso, the extraction of the rectum and scrotum, and the cuts made to the facial features, all had a surgical quality to them. This indicated that they had been made with speed and absolute precision. All wounds showed a distinct lack of bleeding, either attributed to the fact that blood was being extracted at the same time the incisions were being made, or because the wounds themselves had been cauterized. Rigor mortis had not set in, despite the death having occurred more than 24 hours beforehand, and the corpse did not emit the usual cadaverous odours. Even though the body had been covered with vultures when it was first discovered, there were no signs to indicate that they had fed on the flesh or entrails. The most disturbing aspect of this case, however, was the fact that the toxicology reports showed no signs of anaesthesia or an accompanying paralysing agent having been administered at the time these injuries were inflicted. This was extremely odd, because there were also no signs of any kind of restraint found anywhere on the victim's body. This determined that the individual had been fully conscious during the entire procedure, and must have been paralysed by some other means. It is unlikely that he was able to move freely due to the immaculate nature of the cuts. Indeed, when the cranial cavity was opened, the coroner's report listed two items, an unimpaired skull cap, meaning the cranium was otherwise undamaged, and signs of a cerebral edema. The presence of a cerebral edema without accompanying trauma to the skull is indicative of an agonizing death. The autopsy lists the cause of death as follows. Acute hemorrhage in multiple traumatisms, there is a component of causa mortis by Varga stimulation. Roughly translated, this means that the victim died of cardiorespiratory arrest, brought on by extreme pain. The report also states that there was an element of torture 
with regards to the death of this individual. The victim's name is known in smaller circles, but out of respect for his family, we will not divulge it here. What we will say is that he was a 53-year-old man who suffered with both epilepsy and alcoholism. He frequently visited the reservoir to fish, and he had been reported missing three days prior to his body being discovered. Police found his clothes hidden in the woods on the opposite bank, suggesting that he had taken them off and had then swam 80 metres to the other side for a more lucrative fishing spot. Family members confirmed that this was a usual habit of his. He had been taking Gadernal for the epilepsy, and authorities initially believed that he had mixed alcohol with his medication, and that this had resulted in him experiencing a strong reaction, collapsing and dying after a strenuous swim. They believed that his body was then preyed upon by scavengers such as rats, insects and vultures, and that his injuries were a combination of decomposition and animal predation post-mortem. However, it was quickly established that this was unlikely, due to other findings in the coroner's report. The victim had not been dead long enough for natural decomposition of the suggested magnitude to have taken place, nor had enough time passed in order for animals to have eaten the amount of flesh and organs that were now missing. Add to this the fact that there were no signs of predation even having occurred. There were no bite marks or telltale signs that are usually left by the beaks of carrion birds. All incisions were of an unnatural, possibly man-made origin. Despite the seemingly overwhelming evidence to suggest that foul play had occurred, investigators quickly closed the case and dismissed it as an unfortunate tragedy, stating that the man had died of natural causes attributed to his illness and lifestyle choices. For this reason, the case is not widely known outside of Brazil, and even inside of Brazil, you would be hard-pressed to find someone who was familiar with the specifics. Authorities have been accused of covering up the wider details regarding this death, and there is, in fact, evidence to support this claim. The fact that the case only came to light six years after the incident, via an internal leak, speaks volumes about a possible desire to keep it out of the mainstream press. Furthermore, in almost every single article regarding this story, the location the body was found is almost always incorrectly reported as Guarapiranga Reservoir. This is a falsehood. The body was discovered on the banks of the much larger Billings Reservoir, a few miles to the east, and although geographically speaking, the two waterways are close to one another, the body was nowhere near Guarapiranga. This has led many researchers to believe that some of the details were incorrectly reported in order to further throw the public off the scent. But why do this if it was believed to have been a natural death? Why the secrecy to begin with? Theories regarding what happened to this unfortunate individual have been varied to say the least, but ultimately, it comes down to just four possibilities two of which require an open mind. First of all, if we are to look at this case with due diligence, we must question the official explanation, as at first glance, it does not appear to stand up to scrutiny when we take into account the details of the coroner's report. As we have said, the presence of a cerebral edema suggests that this man died a very painful death. And whilst it is true that sufferers of epilepsy do not feel any pain during a seizure, there is no denying that the body itself goes through a variety of trauma, of which a cerebral edema is a rare, but possible outcome. A particularly bad seizure will cut off oxygen supply to the brain, which in itself will cause varying degrees of damage, if not outright death. However, the autopsy clearly states that the victim had died from cardiac arrest. Whilst it is also very rare for an epileptic fit to cause such complications, seizures do increase a sufferer's heart rate considerably during an episode, and if violent enough, could cease heart function if particular variables regarding the person's lifestyle are met. As we have already learned, this individual was middle-aged and an alcoholic, and therefore could have had a compromised cardiorespiratory system under those circumstances. Although very unlikely, it is not beyond all possibility 
that both the cerebral edema and heart failure were brought on by an epileptic seizure. This still leaves the question though, of how the injuries inflicted to the rest of the body had occurred. Some have speculated that the apertures could have been caused by some form of burrowing animal, which preyed upon the body after death and consumed the flesh and internal organs from within. But the uniformity of these holes, and the fact that they had a surgical quality to them, invites a degree of scrutiny upon this theory, particularly because of the cauterization of some of the wounds, which is wholly unnatural to say the least. As already determined by the coroner himself, it is highly unlikely that these abrasions were caused by predation or decomposition given the time frames involved. So the question must be asked, could this individual have been murdered? And if so, who could have inflicted such injuries upon another human being? And perhaps more importantly, why would they kill somebody in this way? What was their motive, if they even had a motive at all? Murder was ruled out fairly quickly during the investigation, due to a lack of evidence suggesting another party's involvement. There was no indication of restraint, or signs of any kind of a struggle between the victim and a would-be attacker. There were also no other tracks other than the victims at the site where the body was discovered. Authorities also questioned whether it was even possible for another human being to have inflicted such injuries unless they were a highly skilled surgeon and even then it would have been extremely difficult without some form of anaesthetic or paralysing agent. Extraction of organs via suction devices is used in some medical procedures, but it nearly always damages the organ being removed during the process, so what would have been the purpose of doing this besides abject torture? Although it is not an impossibility, homicide by another human being is perhaps even more unlikely than a death by natural causes. So with that in mind, we are either left with the possibility that this was in fact a natural death, where nearly every single variable somehow aligned in an extremely unlikely way to present the image of an extremely unnatural death, or that the death was so unnatural that it begins to enter the realms of the supernatural. There are those who believe that he could have been attacked by an unknown cryptid stalking the woodlands around the reservoirs. Indeed, People from the surrounding villages have reported all sorts of strange goings on over the years, and this isn't the first or last mutilation to have occurred in the area, but it is certainly the worst. However, it is difficult to attribute this case to local legends when there is little to no evidence to support the existence of such. Elsewhere, similarities have inevitably been drawn between this case and the multitude of animal mutilations recorded all over the world. These mutilations have often been attributed to UFO activity and possible extraterrestrial experimentation on various species of mammals, particularly those of the bovine, ovine and porcine varieties. Indeed, when the coroner was shown images of these animal mutilations in the years following the investigation, he was shocked at how similar the incisions were to those found on the body of this unfortunate individual. In particular, the way in which the eyes and skin around the jawbone had been removed was of a striking resemblance, as were the apertures through which the internal organs had been extracted, all indicative of the same modus operandi. So could extraterrestrials have abducted this man? Could they have subjected him to a swift but extremely brutal procedure in which he lost his life? If so, one would have to question the motives of these beings and express a deep concern over their complete disregard for human life. After all, if we recall the coroner's report, this man was subjected to the most harrowing experience imaginable, having his skin peeled from his face, eyes gouged out, tongue removed, organs sucked from his body, blood completely drained, and both rectum and scrotum cored out and dismembered, all in the same instance, whilst fully conscious without anaesthetic, and completely paralysed. They clearly had no sympathy or consideration regarding the utter pain and suffering this man went through. They then discarded his remains like trash, with no apparent attempt to hide his body. For that reason, this theory should give anyone pause for thought, and we would be reluctant in considering it a possibility. 
if not just for the disturbing connotations it puts in one's mind regarding how extraterrestrials might view the human race. This case is now well over a quarter of a century old, and whilst authorities consider the investigation closed, whether or not they believe their official line, it is still very much unsolved in the eyes of many people. And whilst some aspects of this story might seem unbelievable, the details are all there in the coroner's report, and in photographs which are all widely available to the public. A quick search on Google for the Guarapiranga Reservoir mutilation will garner results if you so wish to research this further, but be warned, the images are extremely graphic and unsettling. If you are brave enough, we urge you to look into this case yourself and draw your own conclusions. Our hearts go out to the family of this poor man. May peace be upon his soul.